Cool. Um, all right. So um, today we will, um, unless there's something we should discuss, someone can speak up. Um, we can um, continue our discussion of uh, routing. I want to give you guys the next program assignment, but um, I'm going to do that on Friday, kind of keep the um, discussion of routing together. And then on Friday, I can introduce the program assignments. I'll <clears throat> adjust some of the deadlines. Not that it terribly matters, but I definitely want to make sure I give you guys enough time to implement everything. <clears throat> I apologize for my voice. I am uh, a little bit sick right now. So hopefully it's not Corona and um, I'll be back in full action soon. All right. Um, let me see. <clears throat> Good if I share the screen. <clears throat> um, okay. Cool. Cool. Great. Okay. So we looked at um, <clears throat> different ways of routing. Uh, who remember the who remembers the two approaches we've looked at um, the other day? What were their names? Anybody? Anybody? All right, those were uh, link state and distance vector. Distance vector is something you definitely want to know because um, your next program assignment. Um, or the following program assignment will be on distance vector. So you guys will actually be implementing that algorithm um, in your simulation. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Awesome. All right. So I want to give you guys two other approaches um, that can be used in routing. Um, and we'll see kind of um, how they end up being used at the, um, at the level of the internet. Okay. So, um, the first approach is how to discover a route on demand, right? So in uh, link state routing, everybody needs to collect the information, the whole information about the topology of the network. And they use Dijkstra or some other algorithm to compute the shortest path or some set of paths, right? In distance vector, we are disseminating a distance to the destination, right? Um, not the whole route. But again, that has to be computed a priori or kind of while the network exists that distance vector messages and routing tables are being exchanged. So what if this network simply exists and we want to um, discover a route through it? So each node would, would be able to do this on, on its own. How would you go about it? The only thing I could think of would be like depth first or breadth first search, which just would be garbage. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. So, how would you how would you go about performing a search in this network if you don't know the topology? Just have a node talk to all of its neighbors until mm -hmm. the packet gets to the destination, and then you can like you like chain the path. So like. I say I started at U, and then U sends like its name to V and X, and then like it builds a list all the way to the end, and then it can backtrack the list. That's very good. So you could sort of do Dijkstra kind of in the network itself, right? You could send a route discovery packet, which would be forwarded by other nodes and re-forwarded by other nodes that get it, um, assuming each node retransmits it to its neighbors, and then you would eventually get the packet to um, to the destination. Right? You could do a couple of tricks to make this easier. For example, you could you could send the packet from U to V to X and to W. Okay. Now let's say V gets this packet. 
this root discovery packet, and it sends it out to all its neighbors. Well, it doesn't need to send it back to you because it got it from you, and it tries to send it to uh, W and X, but then that's fine. X gets that packet, but it already got one from you, and so while X forwarded the, the root discovery packet it got from you, it doesn't need to forward the, the root discovery that it got from V. Right? So you can kind of, instead of it being everybody rebroadcasting every other, everybody's packet, you can have, you can design this algorithm such that everybody resends the root discovery um, only once um, for a particular root query. So eventually that packet gets to Z, and then Z replies to that packet only to the first packet it gets. Okay? And then the reply can go over the discovered path. Now, why would Z only discover, why would it make sense for Z to only reply to the first root request packet it gets? Because that would be the shortest path, right? The first one that gets. That would be. <laughs> yes. Yes, that would be the quickest path. Not necessarily the shortest, but the quickest. Right. Can I ask right? a question? So you're saying that yeah. U sends a network discovery packet to, to V and X, and then V and X both send one out. So V would mm -hmm. send one to W and to X, or would it yes, not send yes. it to X? Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically the network discovery packet goes through every um, edge of the graph. Yes. Okay. So, so V creates its own data packet then, or, it, or it's just routing it to every, I, yeah, okay, no man. I get it. It rebroadcasts re the packet it gets. Um, it it actually it it rebroadcasts the packet it gets, but it adds itself to it as like as a, a to, you know to record the path that that root discovery packet took. Okay, yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to think about on that. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yep. Cool. Um, okay, so what happens if we're going through this process of discovering these routes on demand and then? Um, what happens if there are frequent changes to network topology? That there are different links being created between nodes, there are um, uh, nodes being taken down or links being taken down. What would be kind of the effect on this on this protocol of, of changes to network topology? What would you guys expect? Well, if you start taking links out of the equation, wouldn't that change the quickest route? So it would. And and so, and so if the route before was u to x to y to z, then that and we took out y, for instance, then you know your shortest path is going to change. It would be uh -huh. like u to x to w to z, mm -hmm. or something like that. So it would change um, the whole graph itself, right? Right. So what should you, the node you, do then? Is that going to have to rebroadcast and find the next shortest length? It might have to, right? It right. might first. It 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 uh, would need to know somehow that the route has changed, right? It's not clear how that would happen, right? Um, and then it would need to know to rediscover the route or to find an alternative route, right? right. So sometimes these protocols, um, Z, let's say, would reply to multiple route request packets to establish kind of multiple routes to the destination. There's some kind of optimizations there. But basically, you just... yeah, uh, question, go ahead. I don't know who was talking first, but um, so then would that actually uh, kind of clog up some of the network and like add more overhead if there's like if the if the topology is constantly changing and it needs to be sending out broadcasts to figure out the shortest path, would that have a, a decent impact on the network? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, that would be a lot of control traffic. Now, in some cases, right? Let's say you wants to discover a path to Z, but V has already gone through that process, right? Maybe V would say then, oh, you know what? I actually know what the path is. It goes through X and Y, and you know, there's your path, right? And so then you would say, okay, great. Well, now I'm routing through V. Maybe that's not the best route, but at least I don't have to go through all the discovery process. Right? My my root discovery has been shortcut. Um, so that's um, that's one possibility. You can kind of steal routes. 
you can also overhear that. So let's say if U is trying to discover path to Z and uh, there's a reply packet going from Z to U saying, yep, the shortest path is through Y and X. Well, X can overhear that and say, okay, great. Now I know how to reach Z. I don't need to do my own route discovery. So, um, and then, you know, when you're sending a packet, uh, an actual data packet, you might include the route in the packet itself and say, I would like it routed through X, Y, and Z, please. Well, could you also have, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, could you also have issues with like dropped or corrupted packets? Um, so say your, your fastest route there um, somehow gets corrupted or garbled or something like that. Would it just throw that away because it wouldn't really know what it was? And then you would basically get set up with a slower link. I mean, because I, depending on how long it's set up. Yes. So good question. Um, in general, what I'd want us to do when we think about these protocols is to think, is to be specific about the types of failures that you're expecting, right? So um, if the packets can be changed arbitrarily, right, where you're putting some completely wrong route in there just to fool somebody, we would call that generally a Byzantine failure, um, in which case the assumption is that the attacker can do anything with the data, right? Um, this is sort of like a nuclear option, right? Like at that point, almost anything is possible. Um, but those things are hard to architect when you have signed messages, as, as you as you can easily have in these protocols. So, a an interesting um, kind of a more uh, realistic way of asking that that question of what could happen is what could happen if packets are dropped, for example, for whatever reason, right? Either because of corruption or because of over. Uh, because of full buffers, things like that, right? That's a common that's a common case. And in that case, in this protocol in source routing, let's say your root request packet wouldn't actually be able to traverse the fastest path. And so Z could then presumably get a root discovery packet going over an alternative path and then reply to that. So the result of that would be that you would not have the most optimum, uh, the fastest path set up on the UZ connection. Jason, did I answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Cool. All right, so that's source routing. Um, and then there's this other cool thing that you can do, which is called um, geographic routing. Um, and the idea there is that somehow, by magic, you know the location of Z. Okay? And so you can sort of route packets towards Z. You figure out that X is actually closer to Z than U. And so by forwarding the packet to X, you're getting it closer to Z. Um, this works okay in uh, certain types of highly mobile networks where um, maybe the network is too mobile to actually try to establish a route. In instance, it would be too hard to have link states set up because the topology changes all the time. You would spend a lot of time just updating everybody on what the new set of links is. It's too difficult to do distance vector because the topology changes, and so you would need to keep resending uh, the routing tables. Okay? It's too difficult to do source routing because by the time you do the whole the round trip to discover a route and then establish it on the reverse direction, the topology has already changed. Okay? So if you live in that world and these routing protocols just don't work fast enough to keep up with your topology changes, you might need to do something like geographic routing. Right? Now, it's sort of a last uh, kind of worst scenario. Those things don't generally work well, very well, and they kind of rely on um, a certain density of nodes and kind of uniformity of the network to, have, to avoid local minima where you can't make any more forward progress. Uh, there's no one that you know that's closer than you to the destination, and so you can't really forward it to anybody other than by kind of you know, re retracing that the packet steps. Um, but it is kind of another approach that you can use when the mobility is very, very high. Okay, so now that we know all the different approaches, sorry guys, I'm gonna mute for a second, blow my nose, because this is getting silly. Uh, where's my mute button?
All right, back in action. Um, so now that we talked about the different high-level mechanisms for routing, let's see how those are actually implemented inside protocols. So the first routing protocol that was widely used is something called RIP or Routing Information Protocol. This was distributed in early um, versions of Unix um, in, in the BSD Unix uh, distribution. Okay. So it is a very simple distance vector protocol where nodes advertise their distance to some other subnet. Um, and it's kind of designed to only work within fairly small networks. Okay. So it assumes that um, each hop costs one. Um, we're only counting subnets, basically how many subnets we are traversing between, um, how many subnets we're traversing between routers. Um, the max path can be only 15 hops. So there's only, there's kind of a limit on how large this network can get. This would be a network within an organization. Um, there is a poison reverse to avoid the count to infinity problem, um, which is set to 16. So anything 16 hops just basically counts as infinity. Um, and there's an automatic exchange of distance vector messages or routing tables every 30 seconds with the neighbors, right? So router A and B would automatically send each other routing tables every 30 seconds. Um, there's a limit to how many subnets can be advertised. And so maybe if you have more than that, you need to rotate them rotate what is getting included in each advertisement message. Okay. Um, and if there's no um, if there's no refresh, then if you don't get an update, then eventually you end up removing um, entries from the routing table or links from the routing table or reachability of a certain subnet from the routing table. And so you kind of have to keep refreshing the distance vector state for uh, routers to be able to act on it. So, in this network, um, if we um, let me see, how do I start? It? If we look at the uh, the routing table in A or the routing cost, we would see that U is subnet U is at one hop, uh, subnet V, which is here, would be at two hops, which is one hop for this subnet and the second hop for this subnet. Okay, so we're simply looking at how many subnets we're traversing. It's not even clear how long this traversal will take. The routing metric is simply the number of subnets. So it gives you kind of some idea of distance, but not this isn't really optimized to um, look at any kind of other routing metric other than subnet distance. All right, the way this is implemented is very simple. You have your network stack, and in the application layer, you have this routed daemon, route daemon, um, running the RIP protocol and sending messages to other routers. Okay, so each router would be running a Linux stack. On each router, there would be this, this route D process. And these route D processes would communicate with each other by sending um, UDP messages okay, on port 530, one of the reserved ports. And then once the route D process figures out what the routing table should look like, um, which subnets are reachable on which interface, it would then install that routing table into the IP layer um, in the operating system. And so this weird thing that runs at the in the application layer uses UDP to exchange messages, to encapsulate messages, and then installs information in the operating system in the routing table. Okay. So why would... Uh, RIP use UDP packets to communicate. Um, why not use something else? I mean, isn't this inefficient? I mean, does it matter if the information gets there or not? Like if it's just using a UDP, it's just sending that information. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's a, it, it doesn't really need to like send a response and a action packet back, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It sends the messages every thirty seconds, and so those messages either get there and then 
And then let's say so A sends a message every 30 seconds to B, router A sends a message to router B. And if that message gets there, great, then B can route through A. If for whatever reason that message doesn't get from A to B, then it doesn't matter what that message contained, B can't route to A anyway. Right. right. That link is broken. So you don't really need any extra reliability on top of this. All right. The other reason is that uh, because this runs at the application layer, it's easy for this application to access UDP um, um, as a as a socket, basically. All right. So kind of a, uh, not the most elegant, uh, definitely a sufficient solution given the semantics of, of this protocol. Other questions? Any questions? In this case, would UDP be faster than doing it TCP anyway? Or um it would be faster uh that might not matter though right because we're sending a message every 30 seconds so even with uh, kind of the different delays that are introduced at, by tcp it you know they're much shorter than 30 seconds so it wouldn't okay. really matter um but it does use fewer resources and we don't need any more reliability than um right because if the message doesn't get there then there's no link to advertise anyway Right. Right. So, um, excuse me for one sec. Right. Okay. So, uh, the next protocol, um, which allows you to route in larger networks. Okay. Right. This is RIP is only limited to uh, fifteen hops. Right. So if you want to implement a larger network, uh, for example, something that spans more than just a campus network, we want to talk about something at the level of, I don't know, a small ISP, for example. Um, right. You're going to need a different, a different protocol that's more scalable. So um, to the rescue is open shortest path first, or OSPF. Um, open means that it's publicly available. The implementation is publicly available. Um, which is different from Cisco's inter-gateway routing protocol, which has remained proprietary until 2015. Um, now they, you can kind of use either one and, and they're open. Um, but anyway, we have open shortest path first, or OSPF. It is a link state protocol, meaning that routers know the connectivity between not just to the next routers, but kind of throughout this network. And then they can compute um, and the, the routing path using Dijkstra or, or something similar. Okay. A couple of interesting things about it. Um, one is that the communication is done through IP, but not through UDP. In other words, um, we are using, or OSPF is using raw sockets. Okay. So remember I said that you have a, either a TCP or a UDP packet, which is then carried by an IP, by, by an IP packet or within an IP packet with an IP header. You could, if you wanted to, send your bytes directly to the IP layer. So instead of first opening a socket and forming a uh, TCP or UDP packet, you could just send a buffer to IP and then have the operating system create an IP packet with you know, some source address, some destination address, whatever, right? And then, and then just send that out. So that's called a raw socket. And um, that requires that the endpoint to which you're sending that IP packet can interpret that, right? That there is some raw socket kind of pulling those IP packets and interpreting whatever you put in there. Okay. So that allows you to skip the overhead of uh, UDP or TCP. And uh, yeah, so that's how it uh, disseminates this information. There will be a topology map at every node, and then you can use Dijkstra to, to compute the path. Um, now, the way this is implemented or organized is that an OSPF network will be divided into different areas. Okay. So you would have these um, kind of dissemination of connectivity information between routers in each area. And each of these routers would be able to run Dijkstra to kind of figure out how to route from here to here. Okay. Now, the same is true for the backbone area, which may be then connected to a higher level ISP. Okay. Um, and then this dissemination of connectivity information in one area is simply summarized as reachability information 
when it's sent out to, um, to the backbone area. Okay? So for example, let's say there's some subnet connected to this router. Okay? Um, to route to the subnet, this node could compute this actual path because it knows the link information. Okay? But when this node advertises, it talks to these other routers, it would basically say, hey, I can get your messages to the subnet that's connected here, but I'm not gonna tell you how I'm gonna do it. Okay, so from the perspective of this backbone network, it looks like all the subnets are basically directly connected to this router. It's sort of like a one hub distance vector thing, right? Where this node advertises the reachability, but it doesn't tell you how it reaches that node. Okay? And then all the nodes in the backbone area kind of communicate their connectivity um, so that anyone can in here can compute the shortest path to anyone else in here. And then once you, let's say, once a packet reaches this router, then this router says, okay, great. I advertise reachability of some subnet here. So now I'm gonna compute the path to actually get there. And so it's kind of link state divided by these different areas, isolated into these different areas. Um, what else is interesting here? Um, there is security built into this protocol, so we can kind of use it in more production networks. Um, you can actually advertise or handle multiple um, same cost paths, right? Because you have link states, so you can compute multiple paths. Um, there's support for multicast, which we didn't talk about too much yet. Um, and you can also have different cost metrics, right? So instead of just advertising um, the hop count of how many subnets you, can, you need to get through to get to a destination, you can also advertise um, what is your cost of reaching that destination. Excuse me. Questions? Cool. Um, all right, so let's say that you wanted to configure your the routing metric to advertise low latency or um, high bandwidth. Okay. You basically advertise your routing cost, okay, but it's up to you as the network administrator to define what this cost means. Okay, so for latency, you could basically just translate it or just advertise the latency that you have, right? And the goal would be to minimize latency. But if you wanted to maximize bandwidth, what would you need to advertise as your link cost? And you guys may not remember this, but we would then advertise one over the bandwidth, right? Because then we would want to find a path that has the minimal one over bandwidth um, aggregate metric or routing metric. All right, so um, we continue our journey in finding the protocol that can work in route larger and larger networks. So as we get to internet scale uh, routing, um, we will basically divide internet into these um, different, what are called autonomous systems. So a an autonomous system would be a, a, a portion of the internet that is administered by um, somebody, either an ISP or a, an, a, an admin, or maybe it is a country network, right? But basically an autonomous system has its own administration that doesn't depend on, on, on anybody else. So an ISP maybe generally would have one AS, but if there are some mergers and, and a large ISP could control more than one um, AS. Okay. So the routers in an autonomous systems will run the same routing protocol, an intra-AS routing protocol. And there are some set of routers in this AS and they might run RIP, OSPF, IGRP, something, whatever this administrative um, domain wants to do. And then the routers on the edge of these autonomous systems connect to each other and they exchange the reachability information using an intra-AS routing protocol. Okay? So we have intra-AS running inside each, each autonomous system 
and then they communicate the reachability to the different subnets that are contained in this AS via an, um, uh, an inter-AS routing protocol. Um, all right, what else do I want to say? So that's inter-AS. Um, okay, and then generally this would be called BGP, right? There's kind of only one inter-AS uh, routing protocol at this point, which is BGP. Okay, so you can see more, yeah. Is there any benefit to say AS1 and AS3 running different um, protocols? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Ah, great question. Thanks for the lead in. That's what this slide does, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> okay, so there's basically, there's basically uh, three different reasons. Excuse me. Okay, so there's basically um, three different reasons. One is the, the scale. So, um, at the inter AS level, we basically want this network to get to be very large, right? We want to have the internet grow and grow or kind of handle as many holes as there, as there possibly be. So, it needs certain uh, simplifications as to the information that it ends up advertising. Okay. Um, IP helps us a little bit with this because it's a hierarchical space, so we can advertise not individual IP addresses, but prefixes or, or subnets. Right? And then inside each um, autonomous system, what is of more importance is not, is not scalability, but flexibility. Right? Um, ISPs might not just carry IP traffic for normal people like, like you and I, but they might handle they might need to handle different types of traffic for companies, for other telecoms that are using their network, um, for uh, connections between data centers, for reserved bandwidth for Netflix, things like that. So they need more flexibility to handle um, the configurations of the routers internally to meet the needs of their customers. Okay. Um, there's also differences in policy um, where at the inter AS level, there might be restrictions of how the routing should happen. For example, uh, maybe CIA wants to pay some ISPs in the US to carry their traffic, but the requirement is that CIA traffic can never leave United States, right? Even if there's like a faster path through Mexico, right? Can't do it, it has to stay inside, inside the US, right? Um, or maybe it's okay if it goes to Europe, but it can go through China. Right, so things like that can be must be controlled kind of at the policy level, which is um, the inter AS, um, which is the domain of inter AS, and then inside um, each AS is free to make decisions based on performance. Right, it's kind of all the network, all the traffic is carried internally anyway, so you might as well optimize it for performance and not so much policy. Okay. Um, and then for performance, right, inter AS um, scalability or policy may dominate as the primary reason, and then inside each AS, um, the, the, the focus is performance and low cost. All right, so that's kind of a long answer, but that's the slide. Um, Justin, did I answer your question? Do you have yeah, a absolutely. It sounds a lot, it makes a lot of sense. Cool. Thank you. Yep, yep. So, okay, so if we kind of drill into this, um, you'll see something interesting. You have these um, autonomous systems and each inside of them there's basically routers right we just say that this set of routers is is logically is, is administered right by um, the administrators of this as which are different from the administrators of this as okay cool so at each router in here we're still going to have a forwarding table right where a packet comes in the router looks at the packet consoles the routing table and says okay it should go out this link or it should go out this link now those routing tables, the information for those routing tables can come from different sources. It can come from the intra-AS routing protocol, which would be RIP or OSPF or IGRP, okay? Um, which basically would figure out the topology of the routers inside this AS. But let's say that this router wants to route a package 
or get a packet that is destined for some subnet in here, the reachability or basically knowing that this router should forward a packet over this link would arrive via BGP or the inter-AS routing protocol. Okay, so your router's in here, the routing tables are built up by both intra-AS routing protocols and inter-AS routing protocols. Right. We'll look into that some details on this in a second. Okay, so intra-AS is for internal destinations and inter-AS and intra-AS, the interaction between those two is for external destinations or external subnets. Okay, so let's let's look at an example. So we have some subnet X that lives in AS3, and um, um, here's kind of how we can figure out how to route to it. So the intra-AS routing protocol in AS3 would exchange the reachability around of, of how to get to X. Okay, so let's say router 3B um, knows that it can reach destinations in the subnet. It would then say to 3A, hey, I can reach X, um, I can reach X at some cost, whatever, and uh, 3A would get this information and say, okay, great, now I can reach X by forwarding uh, packets for X on this link. Okay. So this reachability would be communicated using um, an intra AS router protocol, and that would configure the tables on routers on router 3A. Now, um, 3A would communicate this information, the fact that it knows how to deliver packets to X, to 1C in another autonomous system via the inter-AS routing protocol. Okay. And now 1C would use the intra-AS routing protocol to disseminate this information um, to um, 1D, right? So if 1D wants to send something to X, it would get this information from 1C via inter-AS routing protocol, but an inter-AS routing protocol would send this information of reachability of X to 1B, which then would be able to send it to other subnets, to other autonomous systems. And so it's the interplay of these protocols that establishes the routing table. I guess that's kind of the point of this. Okay, so when we talk about um, routing between autonomous systems, what we really are talking about is BGP. There were other proposals. Uh, BGP is the thing that remains, and uh, that's basically how routing internet gets done. Okay, the glue that holds the internet together. Um, and so it allows subnets to basically say, hey, I'm here, and then routers that are connected to the subnet can advertise that, that reachability. Okay. Um, so external BGP or eBGP would get this information, the, the reachability information from neighboring um, autonomous systems, and then iBGP, the, the intra-AS routing protocol, would communicate that information to um, other routers inside the in, inside each um, autonomous system. Okay, so a BGP message in general, this advertisement will take the following form. Okay, so let's say there's a there's a semi permanent connection, a BGP connection on on this link between these two routers. Okay, so 3A might might advertise that it can reach or route packets to a particular prefix. Maybe this prefix identifies that subnet X we've been talking about. Okay, so I can reach X. Um, my next hop, the next hop for reaching this would be the uh, my IP address or the IP address of this interface. Okay, so that would be communicated to 1C. And then um, it would also provide the AS path or path vector of how it would reach X. So maybe let's take another example. Let's say that X is over here, okay? And 1C advertises that it can reach X. This path would then contain AS1 and AS2, right? And so this path would maybe contain autonomous systems that are in India or uh, sorry, in China, or those that are not in China. So when you see an advertisement, hey, I can reach X, and you see some autonomous systems that are well known to be 
in China and you're routing packet for CIA, you would say, okay, I can't use that advertisement. I can't route through that router because it's going to forward its packet to, um, you know, through a Chinese AS and that's, you know, not part of my contract. Right. Um, so the interesting thing about this is that this is a lot like source routing. Right? We're, we're advertising this distance vector thing where, hey, I can, reach, I can reach somebody, but it also gives you a path, but this path is extremely high level, right? It's basically a policy level path. You still don't know all the different routers that the path contains. It just tells you what, what other kind of portions of the internet your packets are going to traverse. Right? But it also gives you an estimate of the cost of the link, which is the number of hops through, uh, through autonomous systems. So it's a little bit like RIP in that the routing path is the distance to other subnets, except those subnets are extremely large because they're not subnets, they're autonomous systems. Questions? So is that kind of similar to um, source routing where they could like make up that information as well, just to bait, bait people basically? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, this is this is interesting. This is actually where changing information gets gets pretty interesting, right? You can do there's all kinds of security issues with with BGP and and uh, this is where you can steal steal information, right, or steal someone else's traffic. Right? So let's say that that X is here in AS2, okay, and then for whatever reason. AS3 or this router starts saying, hey, I can reach X in like no latency whatsoever, right? If you're sitting on 1C, you say, well, AS2 said it can reach X, but there were all these hops and you're getting an advertisement for X from AS3 and you say, hmm, this seems only one hop away. That's great, I'm gonna forward my packet here, right? And now that's basically how Russia gets to steal Google traffic until someone says, whoa, 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 why is all the traffic getting black holed in, in Russia? I feel like that would be a really easy thing to track though, wouldn't it? I mean, you could just see where the data ends. Yes, yes, it is. Um, it is definitely something you can you can do. Um, and I'll, I'll get to it in a second. Um, I forget <laughs> where it is on my slides. Um, there it is, okay. I guess I can talk about it now. So, so with that, with that how would you how would you track it if you're using like a, a Tor browser or a Tor tunnel or a VPN or something like that? So you as a consumer of the network, you can't really do anything about it. But if you're a network administrator, people generally know how these um, autonomous systems are connected to each other, right? This is known. Like the internet topology is roughly known. So you can have an import policy where if let's say we're trying to route to the subnet Y and um, three advertises it at, at, at some cost or maybe you don't want to route through AS3, you can simply set the import policy, the BGP import policy at 1C to say ignore advertisements from AS3. Right? So you as the administrator can say, nope, I'm not going to trust this router or I don't want to route anything through it. Um, and I'm basically going to ignore its advertisements, right? So you don't have to take other people's BS, BS on how, you know, what they can forward at what cost. All right, so let's look at an example. So let's say, um, how does uh, 1D, which is here, forward packets to subnet Y, right? So let's say that there is reachability information being there's some routers here that say I can reach, I can forward data to Y and then those advertisements go over eBGP to uh, this router and this router and they re-advertise it and then that information eventually propagates to router 1D. How does 1D make a decision of how to route to Y? Well, it can look at a number of things. It can be configured to prefer routing to a certain AS over another, right? Maybe there's a better contract between AS1 and AS2, right? Or maybe there's a better contract between AS3 and AS1, who knows, okay? 
it can pick the shortest path um, in terms of the number of ASs that, um, that the packet will traverse. Okay? It can also, if the path is equal, as in this case, decide to get rid of the packet out of this AS as soon as possible. Right? Because all these routers are, are run by are run by a single organization. So if we forward the packet here and here and then here, that's two hops. So that's twice the traffic that we need to forward. If we just forward the packet here and then out of our network, we're only forwarding the packet once. So in aggregate, that's less work. So what happens is there's this idea of hot potato routing, which is basically getting rid of the packet out of your AS as soon as possible. Right? Even, even if you have to use a longer AS path, people will still prefer to get rid of their packets quickly. Not optimal, but that's what happens. Okay. Um, I have a question about that. What's the yeah, upside sure. to getting rid of the package as fast as possible from your uh, AS? Um, it means that you don't have to handle the traffic, right? You, you, so I'm using only one link to get rid of it, to get rid of the packet to AS2, okay, versus two links to get rid of it to AS3. So if there's all kinds of traffic being forwarded every which way through my network, using only one link reduces the amount of load in my network. Gotcha, that, that makes sense, thanks. All right, so let's look at some examples. Let's say we have that we have this network of connected All right. this network of um, connected autonomous systems. Um, and A, B, and C are uh, provider networks, meaning they're large ISPs, they're all peered with each other. And then X, W, and Y, are these smaller networks that are clients, they're still ISPs, they still have other you know, clients connected to them, companies using, or they're, they're still network providers, but um, to reach each other, they have to go through um, these provider networks. Right? And then X is dual homed in that it has connections to two higher layer, higher level ISPs. Okay, so here's some questions. Should B advertise the path B A W to C. Should B tell C that it can forward its packets, that it can forward packets to W? Yes. Why? Well, it's another route that I could take, so I guess it depends on what the latency is. And also, if it's like a different, um, uh, what's the deal I'm looking for? Like a different net. Um, An alternative path? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no, B would yeah. in fact. So B would in fact look at this and say, "Do I want C's traffic? Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. Right? If C sends me traffic, then C has to pay me for the traffic that I'm forwarding on C's behalf. Or maybe if there's like a peering relationship where you know, B and C understand they're going to forward traffic to each other. They're basically peers and they make money by reselling the connectivity to X and, you know, smaller ISPs. They can just kind of trade, like a, make a fair trade on traffic that they forward. So as long as there's a rough balance in traffic going from B to C and from C to B, these guys aren't going to charge each other. Yeah? So for whatever reason, B needs to use C to reach Y if there's a lot of traffic going to Y from B. Okay, now there's a lot of traffic going in that direction. B says, I need to get some traffic forwarded for C so that I don't have to pay C money. And then B could say, yep, I can reach W. I'll take some traffic from, you, from C. Okay, so this is controlled probably just by policy, just based on who contracted with whom for how much money. And then what is the traffic pattern in this network? Does B need to forward some of C's traffic or some traffic on behalf of C? So could C potentially see like if B says, hey, I have a path B A W, 
could C look at that and say, oh, I'm also connected to A and then just do C-A-W or do they just take whatever path is given to them as like a holy grail? Yep, it, it, C would know that, there it has, that it has two paths to W and okay. maybe these links are oversubscribed. Maybe there is already a lot of traffic going between C and A. In that case, C could say, well, I don't want to put any more traffic on this link. I can use this longer path uh, to send my traffic to W. And it's, is that, is that kind of like congestion? If there's a lot of traffic going between C and A, would that cause a lot of congestion, which would make B A W a better option? Um, yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. So if this link is congested, it's it's perfectly great to, you know, if, if there's a lot of traffic just going between C and A, you can definitely route through B to get to W, and then that will hopefully use a different set of paths that doesn't include, you know, this router here that's congested. Thank you. Yep. Um, all right. Um, so why does B not route to W through C? Hops? What do I have to do with hops? Mm -hmm. Yep, it just chooses a, you know, if there's no there's no policy reason, it would basically choose the shortest hop, which is basically one, two hops to W, counting A as hops. Okay, easy one. How does X prevent B routing to C through itself? I would assume that it would have to do with the fact that X is a customer network, not a provider network. Yes, but how would it work? How would it do the, uh, uh, how would it specifically achieve that, right? So that's like a policy goal, but how would it implement it? Could it look and see like the traffic, what their destination is, and maybe see like if C is somewhere in those hops, and if X gets the information from B, it can say, oh, this is going to C, I don't want it. And just kind of get rid of it. It's 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 not really going to reject the traffic once it comes, but it could basically not tell B that it can reach anything in C. Would it right. poison? I was going to say, would it be like a poisoned link then, or would it be just even more basic? It just, it, it just, yeah, don't just don't tell. Just don't tell. <laughs> Fair enough. Just not advertise it. <laughs> like I don't know. <laughs> Right. So anyway, those are just some kind of tricks that happen in um, in BGP routing. All right, let's end it here. A um, couple minutes over time. Um, thank you guys. If you have any more questions, um, I will see you in uh, office hours later on today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.